going to look at a specific part in uh, the life of Samuel out of uh, 1 Samuel uh, at the first king Saul and the Lord is going to remove over the Amalekite deal uh, the Lord is through with having him reject Saul rejecting the details of every command he gives him as the broad scope of it but doesn't fulfill the details of it and I've been telling you how important not only learning but also understanding the details associated with it. Now God told him sent him on a mission against the uh, Amalekites and when he comes back he said and we'll see it here in verse 10 the word of the Lord came to Samuel of course he's the prophet to the king and the nation saying I regret that I have made Saul king for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. That's it's plural. That's important. What he didn't do, he didn't carry out the details of the directive will of God. Listen, God's not satisfied just because you do the general will of God. He wants you to do the specifics of it as well. And there's always details to the directive will of God, like to Jonah. Uh, like to like to Saul and Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul and it was told to Samuel saying Saul came to Carmel and behold he sent up a monument for himself uh, we would say that he set up a monument to himself Then he turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel said to Saul, oh, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command. And that was true. But he didn't carry out the commands. Right? There's different. I carried out the command of the Lord. Samuel said, What then is this bleeping of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them, they, the people, have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. All right? And when the details of the command were given, when the details of directive will was given to them, they were to destroy everything come home with nothing but victory. Great? <clears throat> everything. And he went through details of what, what he meant by destroy everything, didn't he? he? I mean, he went right down to an infant. And Saul brings back... Now, he destroyed all the weak, feeble, everything. He brought back a king and brought ba back spoils of warfare. He brought the best back. And the animals he brought back to sacrifice to the Lord. That wasn't part of his command. All of that might have been good from a human viewpoint. But from a divine viewpoint, it is called the sin of divination. It's called rebellion and insubordination. And he says the rebellion is a sin and the insubordination is amounts to idolatry. I mean, these are really strong languages as you read on in this passage. So after a word of prayer, we're going to talk about, listen, 
if you know anything, and now we know a lot about Saul. <laughs> we have studied a lot about Saul. If you know anything about what the Bible says about Saul, he is the most unlikely person to worship himself. He was a man with low self-esteem. I mean, he had a hard time getting out of bed in the morning because he didn't think he was worthy enough. I mean, he is the most unlikely guy of all the people we might study to actually do this. Because the person you might think most likely to do this would be somebody who was conceited and arrogant. Right? That's the person you would think that would be most likely to do that. Not a guy like this. But he did it. And, and we're going to talk about why because Scripture gives us some evidence of it. We're going to talk about why. But first we're going to do a word of prayer. You know the drill. Those who might not know it that are with us by satellite or the internet. What we mean is that you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you believe that so that you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And he's there to minister the word of God to you, word of God to you like in John 14, 15, and 16. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin has to be confessed to put you back into the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He is the great teacher of the truth of the Word of God, and that's what we're after. Psalm 1-9, if we confess, it's faithful and just to forgive us and declare our unrighteousness. That's a priesthood exercise for Bible study out of 1 Peter 2. So I ask you to take a moment to do that. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins that need to be confessed. So faith just as first John one nine. Sometimes we don't reveal our core beliefs because we're with people that it would offend. Uh, we're not there to offend them. We're there to maybe do something else with them. And that's different than disguising, okay? I mean, we're just showing courtesy, that not interested. I mean, we do it with a lot of things. We do it with politics. We do it, you know, we may not, well, you know, somebody is ill and they're trying to explain to us their sickness. We don't bring ours out and say, well, look, sounds like you got a tough day, but let me tell you about mine, <laughs> you know? This is different. This is, Saul is disguising. And, and you're going to see some things, and you can't really. I mean, if a person is, has in, insight, you can get it. Okay? But for Saul, people aren't always as they appear. He appears, he talks a low game. He talks out of low self-esteem and all of that business, but you're going to see him do something when he becomes king of the mountain. You remember that game we used to play, king of the mountain? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Well, you had to you had to probably be kind of with a rough group, I guess, <laughs> to play that game. But once he got when he got a chance to be king of the mountain, shows he didn't have the capability of being that person. And, and the Lord talks about this. It is difficult, if not impossible, to hide the old man cosmos diabolical core beliefs. It is difficult, if not impossible, to hide it in times of great subjective thinking because that's when it really shows itself. He's, he's, he's going to disguise it in objective thinking and expose it in subjective thinking. You know, we say to we say to somebody, 
well, why don't you tell me how you really feel? That's one of those moments, isn't it? <laughs> Where we're trying to have a little levity in it. Now, this is true whether it's on the bottom side of Great Depression or on the top side, Great Joy. You're going to see it. He, 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 he exposes his low self-esteem, his core, when he's down, but he shows it when he's up. Because these are the two extremes. Your core is going to come out on both sides. And he does it on the top side. And it has everything to do with this monument to himself. And so I want you to remember this. On Saul's return, after a great military victory over the Malachites, Saul stops at Carmel and set up a monument for himself. We call that hero worship. And we have a culture that's eat up with hero worship. We worship everything but the sun. The, well, we might do that. I don't know. Right? We worship everything. I mean, we're into rock music worship and entertainment worship and all that, aren't we? We're a culture of that. Yeah, we're a culture of that. Now, he stops at Carmel. He sets up monument to himself, and we call it hero worship. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Saul, it was told Samuel, Saul has come to Carmel, and behold, I mean, that shocked everybody. It shocked everybody that he set up a monument to himself. The most unlikely person in the whole wide world at that time to set up a monument to himself would have been him. I mean, this guy didn't have enough esteem to get out of bed in the morning. And who is he promoting? He wins this great victory, and who is he promoting? Himself. A monument to himself. Now, most people, when they had great victories, they built an altar to the Lord, and Lord marked the place and put it in the scriptures, and they offered sacrifices, right? <laughs> Later, young David, after anointed, to be king in place of Saul is going to go against Goliath. Saul gives him all kinds of advice, which now nobody wants to take. Because he no longer has the Holy Spirit. It's been removed from him in chapter 15 and 16. David has been anointed. He now has the Holy Spirit upon him, and he goes to war against Goliath. Now listen to me. When he defeated Goliath, the people wrote an ode to David. The people did. And it became number one on the charts for a long time. A long time. And the punchline Saul slays thousands, David ten thousands. It was a tribute to David, great victory. See the difference? You hear the difference? There's a difference between these two kings. These, this is the difference between these, kings, these two kings right out of the chute. The lesson tonight is going to look at four aspects of Saul's worship of himself. This lesson will show Saul's overwhelming need for approval of others. Al dealt with this Sunday. I thought I was already into this one. And I thought, isn't that neat how God backed these up? When you study the life of Saul from chapter 16 through 31 of 1 Samuel, the life of Saul, 
this is from 16. I picked 16 through 31 to be sure that you understood that this is after God has rejected him and has removed the Holy Spirit from his life. Now, the reason I tell you that from when you read Saul's life from 16 to 31, you're going to see the worst of an old man, Cosmos Diabolicus, core belief. Do you understand that? The thing that made the difference in his flesh from the early chapters up to, up to 15 was that God had put the Holy Spirit on him and when you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. It is one of the great grace assets that God gives every believer to neutralize until he can pick his own inadequacies and weaknesses out of his life and replace them with the strength of God in his life when he can pick away the old man cosmos diabolicus false thinking that's been established in his life and replace it with new man divine viewpoint thinking from the word of God. Let me tell you something. You will never maintain spiritual maturity unless you do that. You, you will reach spiritual maturity, but you won't be able to maintain it because your old man core will always topple you. Either on the great victory side of your life or on the great depression side of your life, it will come out like gangbusters. So when you're going through this process of spiritual growth and you reach maturity, God is now going to tell you to maintain that you've got to get real with who you really are. You've got to face, you've got to face some of the things in your life that you haven't been willing to face up with. And you know that God has equipped you with his grace and with his power to be able to do that. That's the story that Paul learned in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Power is perfected in weakness. You know why? Because you're taking off the old man, putting on the new man. You're taking off false, false views of life that the devil fed you. I, I mean that in the bigger picture. Uh, for what God has been teaching you through the word of God. Listen, I want you to get this simple idea. You learn the word of God, listen to me now, to live it. You learn it to live it, not just to learn it. If it's just about learning the word of God, it will puff up your knowledge, 1 Corinthians 8.1, it will handicap you. Knowledge actually can handicap you. If it's not assimilated, it's got to be inhale, exhale of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The inhale, the normal inhale of the word of God, inhale, you know, taking it in and, and applying it, is going to result in verse 17. If you do 16, you'll get 17. If you don't do 16, you don't get 17. It just, it won't be there. So that the man of God is adequately equipped for divine production at the highest level. It won't be there. You've got to, you must have, you must understand that. The person who just seeks knowledge of the, of the word of God without, without learning to live it is described in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 7, as always learning, right? And never coming, right? How does that go? And never, yes. It's 2 Timothy 3, 7. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who is that for? you and through your life comes the testimony of the power of that word of God working in, in your life to other people you know the strongest testimony that
that you have is your salvation, isn't it? When you explain it to other people, you're enthused about it, your convicted, uh, convictions uh, are about it, it's dynamite. Right? When you explain the truth of the Word of God to somebody with conviction, with, with the absoluteness of it in your soul, um, the body language, all of that goes part of convincing another person, even though the Holy Spirit is the final guy to put the stamp on it. All of those things, when a person is excited and, and their, uh, their eye focuses and everything, the body language there, all of that goes in communication. All of that's part of the package of communication. We all know that, don't we? I mean, we know when somebody's flirting and not flirting, don't we? I mean, how, how, where, how did that come from? It comes from body language. They can speak without speaking. We know when somebody frowns. We know when somebody uh, gives us body language that says, I don't think that's good. I don't like that. They don't have to tell you. Even little children do it. It's amazing to me at the early age they learn body language. Um, Evelyn... She's not able to communicate greatly, but you should see her body language when her brother tries to take something from her. She, she lets you know there is no way, Jose. There is no way I'm going to give that up. And uh, so she goes to body language and screaming. Then everybody comes a-running. Everybody comes a-running to her, and, and uh, the boy gets a-running away. He, ru he runs away. Right. So, so listen, you know, the, all of this is, you know, some of this is if, you know, if you're awake in the world, you know some of the stuff I'm telling you about. In this chapter, in chapter 16 through 31, you get a good look at a guy whose core is out. It, it's, it's, it's wide open and on the loose. I mean, it's, it's free-ranging. And, and it's, it's bad, too. And listen, it's bad, and he don't care. He's like Herod the Great. He doesn't care. If you cross me, I'll just kill you. You can't do that. Yes, I can. I'm the king. I'm the king. Huh? I'm the king. I can't. Listen... That's crazy. That, that stuff's crazy. Now listen. Here's the first point. The setting up of this monument to himself reflects his insecurity and weakness of old man Cosmos Diabolicus thinking. Here's Saul's problem. Be careful it doesn't become yours. You're a student of the Bible. You come faithfully. Be sure you're not engaged in selective learning. One of the things I hate about the Internet, one of the great things I hate about it, here's one of the things I hate about it. It's selective learning. It has nothing to do with what God put on my heart to tell you. You know, half my preparation comes from me talking with God about what I should be giving you. That's half my preparation. And I spend a lot of time in preparation. And half of it, half of my preparation is prayer. Mine is talking to God. The worst thing you can do is get in selective learning. Well, I mean, God wants you to study security of your salvation. You want to study the second coming. You know what I'm saying? Selective learning is a bugger boo. Back in the old days, the colonel had so much of this selective learning. What he did is he forced people that came to his website or came to his tapes and pubs, we called them. He forced you to go through the, what he called the 78, 78 basics. Remember that? And there was about 78. <laughs> I mean, he meant a year. Uh, he meant the year 78. But that was a, I mean, I spent a couple of years studying that stuff. And he said, do that before you go anywhere. And he controlled it. 
See? Internet, you can't control. I mean, you wrote to him. He sent you papes and tubs, papes and tapes and pubs. That he went in and see where you were. You were only 34 into it. No, don't give him any. You keep sending him this. Because he understood something that selective learning is not going to develop you. I mean, parents know that about food. Right? I mean, if it was left to the kids, he'd just eat cookies. I'll take cookies. What do you want for breakfast? Cookies? What do you want for lunch? Cookies? Glass of milk and cookies. That's, we don't do that until we become adults and are on our, on our own. Selective learning. Always learning, never able to come to knowledge of the truth is not a winner. It's a loser. That's not a winning principle. Saul had not spiritually grown to understand how to convert old man weaknesses into new man's strengths. Now, he's got the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he's not uh, applying that to the will of God. He's not applying it. I mean, he's, he's gotten jerked by God and by Samuel. Listen, when Samuel gets through with him in 15, he's never going to see him again. The Bible says he never goes back and pays any attention to him again. He walks away from him. And, and when he understood he was going to go, he grabbed the corner. We're going to talk about that next week. He grabbed the corner of his robe and ripped it. He turned around and went, that's a mistake. But let me, since you got it in your hand, let me put it in your heart. And he walked away from him never to see him again. That's tough. And, and listen, we know Samuel loved him. He, listen, he, he wept all night for him. And the next day, God, he got up. God said, go tell him it's done. And buddy, he did it. And he wept no more for him. You know why? Because God's will is more is supreme in my life. See, God's will, that's, that's Samuel. But listen, that wasn't Saul. And Saul, Saul has made some terrible mistakes here. I want to be sure that we don't. Listen, here's what he, he should have learned, and he didn't because he was selective in his learning. He should have learned that my grace is sufficient for you. See, we talk a lot about grace around here, but I'm not sure that you understand it's sufficient for you because when you get in a bind, I don't know that you go to him. Grace means that 100% God is in charge. Grace is 100% God. It ain't 99.1 it ain't or anything. That's why it's called grace. My grace is sufficient. I wonder if we can really grab that, that my grace is sufficient. For power is perfected in weakness. And we talked about this the other day. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather boast about my weakness. So that the power of Christ may dwell on me. Saul is attempting to hide his weaknesses. Rather than boast, rather than boast of the power of Christ. Did you get that? He's got weaknesses, but he won't turn them over to the Lord who will empower him over his weaknesses, right? It says power is perfected or reached its goal. Power reaches its goal when it turns weakness into strength. That word perf perfected is that word that means to reach a goal or, or to reach some, fun, fun, some form of completion. There's nobody in this room that who doesn't have weaknesses. By now you know that. Listen, power is perfected in weakness. Don't hide your weakness. Trans tr listen. Transform it. Transform it. See, that's new man thinking. Old man, yes, weak, who isn't? Transformation is about learning how to convert weakness through grace, right? My grace is sufficient. My grace is, how does it work? It works by grace. My grace is sufficient. It will always work for you because power reaches its goal to change weakness into strength. That's why the word for power connected with the Holy Spirit in the Greek is dunamis. That's the English word dynamite. 
and when the day that was about the most powerful now we would call it uh, nuclear wouldn't we nuclear I mean today we would call it nuclear yeah Saul is living under the power of old man Cosmos Diabolicus thinking like Peter I mean like Peter in Matthew 16 23 it's not that Saul has gone into full-pledged reversionism as far as everybody go like well Paul is or Saul is really out of it as they will later see right later everybody go like he's nuttier than a fruitcake but he's like Peter right now when Jesus said to Peter you remember when he says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, yada, yada, in Matthew 16, 23. And Jesus says, gets behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. In other words, your own. You're into human viewpoint. You're into old man, cosmos, diabolical's viewpoint. And listen, it's a stumbling block to other people. Other people in your relationship, it's a stumbling block to them. It, listen, Saul's a stumbling block to Samuel. Yeah. This monument is a symbol of spiritual trouble, of a spiritual troubled soul. Now, we would all know that. If we was with him, listen, listen, if you were there and you were objective and spiritually in tune, you'd have run to Samuel and told him the same thing. Somebody got to Samuel before Samuel got to Saul and said to Samuel, you're not going to believe this. Behold, Saul has put an on a monument up for himself. You see, and listen, let me tell you what this is. This is weakness. Now listen to me. This is weakness. Agreed. This is weakness. On the top side where victory is. This is weakness. Let me tell you what it is. Listen to me. Tell you. It's overcompensation. He's overcompensating. Now let me tell you about, let me tell you about overcompensating. Overcompensating, the, the idea behind it, the psychology or the interpreting of this word means excessive feelings of in, in, inferiority. Excessive feeling of inferiority. That's when you overcompensate. That's why you overcompensate. This monument is overcompensation for his inadequacy of his, uh, of his view, his view of his inadequacy. Of his low self-esteem. He goes overcompensating. You go over. You go excessive over it. Do you understand that? It's exactly what he did. Listen, it's exactly what a lot of us do. And it is a sign, it is a symbol, it is a sign that you're not dealing with your weakness. Maybe you don't know how. Maybe you don't understand 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You do tonight because grace is sufficient to transform weakness through power of God, through the power of God, because weakness is a flesh, Right? Strength is a divine attribute because of the power of the Holy Spirit working the word, the grace of God through the word of God in your life. It's just how simple it is. It's not complicated. This isn't complicated. This is very simple stuff. But you've got to acknowledge your weakness. And you've got to acknowledge that it has to be transformed into strength. And the answer is, how do you do that? You do it by grace, just like salvation. You went from a natural man to a spiritual man. How did that happen? Grace. How did that happen? The power of God. The power of God. 
when you believe the gospel, the gospel was the power of God to change you. It's the power of God. This is true in the Christian life. This is true in the Christian life. As you move in your spiritual growth maturity, you've got to come to this place. When you hit spiritual growth maturity, he's going to deal with weakness versus strengths. He's going to point your weaknesses out. Th this is okay because everybody's got them. But you've got to face them. He's not willing to do that. Why are you learning the word of God? To live it. Okay, then live it. But live it by grace. Let the word of God transform your life under the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you will see the evidence in your own life. Other people will be able to see it too. Because new body language, new attitude. See, this monument he set up for himself. Now, he could have done it. Listen, he could have done it at home. He could have got home, put it up in his garage. But it wouldn't have served what he was after within his own need of his weakness. He doesn't know or is unwilling to move his weakness under transformation into strength. So he sets it up there as a, as a reminder that he's a new man and he's not. He's the same old slug. Saul, like Cain, thought he could worship the Lord by establishing his own rules and conditions of worship. Set up a monument. A new man would have set up an altar. First of all, a new man would have went down to the letter of the command. He would have made his, he would have improvised or changed on a win. He would have set up an altar. He would have got the right sacrifice. He would have offered it and honored the Lord. Just like everybody else did in the Old Covenant. Because it was a victory that spoke of Jesus Christ. It didn't speak of the flesh. It spoke of Christ, vic the victory of Christ. Shadow Christology would have done that. But Saul didn't do that because he's not interested in promoting Christ. He's interested in promoting Saul because he is so, so insecure that he needs this as a reminder. And listen, when you read on in this story, God considers what he did with this monument idolatry. Because he set it up to himself. You see what, how God looks at idolatry? I don't know how you do, but you better take another look. Do you see that? This is what he's going to call this. Rebellion and insubordination, the monument is idolatry. It, it is evidence of it. L listen, you don't have to build one outside because, listen, the one he built outside had already been built on the inside through false thinking. That monument he built out there to himself came out of who he wanted to be and didn't know how to get there. You need to understand how to get there. Notice that Saul became defensive when Samuel says, what you been doing? Oh, he said, I've completed the mission. I've completed the mission. Samuel said to him, why didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? Listen to his defensiveness. I did. I went on the mission. I brought back the king. I utterly destroyed everything. Oh, what's that bleeping I hear? <laughs> what's that? All oh, the people. All oh, the people. All oh, the people. 
The people. This is a monarchy, not a democracy. What do you mean, the people? You know what the people was? Blame. Oh, the people. It's so easy to blame the people. It's so easy to point one finger out and not see the three pointing back. We saw in the Garden of Eden, we saw everybody do it, right? Everybody did it. Still goes on today. Why was he so defensive? Why was he so defensive? Let me tell you, a defensiveness, when you get defensive, when other people call your hand, they call your bluff, and you get defensive, do you know what's a sign up? Listen, I'm going to tell you because everybody in this room is going to know it now. So you might as well change it. They know you're, you're, you're from a, you've got a weak hand. You're not coming from strength. You're coming from weakness. That's defensiveness is a push-off. I said, get out of here! I mean, that's how we do it. We raise our voice. We, we make threats. We do all that kind of stuff, don't we? It's a defensive mechanism. A defense mechanism is because you've built a wall around your, ins your, your insecurities. You've built a wall around it. It's called defense. You've built a wall around it. This very defensiveness of Samuel shows that Samuel has built a wall around his old man Cosmos Diabolical disillusionment. He's disillusioned. Okay, so you've got low self-esteem. Okay, so you have these feelings of inadequacy. Okay, so you feel insecure at moments in your life. It's, yeah, okay. Welcome to the human race. Welcome to the human race. Now how do you resolve it? Don't do all this crazy stuff. Listen to 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 9 and 10, right? My grace is sufficient. Power is perfected in weakness so that I can deal. Listen, that's transformation. That's Romans 12, 2. That's, you get out of conformity to the world. Listen, everybody's been into conformity of the world. Good morning. The, the listen, the answer to is the answer out of conformity is transformation. This is the deal we're talking about here. And listen, nobody thinks about it until you get to spiritual maturity. But if you don't deal with transformation, if you do not deal with transformation at that point, you're going nowhere. You're going to be that guy who's all puffed up in 1 Corinthians 8.1 and living out 2 Timothy 3.7. That's not what God wants in your life. Now, he's not going to do what he did to Saul. He's not going to remove the Holy Spirit from your life because he's committed to leaving him there in John 14.16. He's there for the ride. Therefore, he's grieved. He's quenched. But he doesn't leave. He's not permitted to leave ever. Under no condition is he permitted to leave. That ought to tell you how secure your salvation is. Because he doesn't enter your life until you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's never permitted to leave it. There's your security system. Therefore, the Holy Spirit in your life, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, has sealed you and pledged you to the day of redemption. Hoo -ah. Let people lie to you. Don't let people lie to you. Here's the second thing. Saul was engaged in psychological worship. Not spiritual. Not spiritual. And he was in psychological worship. I call it the nod to God group. They come on Sunday. Now, 
a lot of people can't come to other Bibles. Let, 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 let me clarify that. Not everybody can get to a Tuesday night because they work till yada, yada. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why you can't. So your great day for worship with God if this church is on Sunday, and I know that. There are a lot of people who can't get here any other time except on Sunday. Okay? I'm talking about that typical guy who's just a nod to God guy or gal. They just go to be seen and, and uh, you know, to have a little bit of seeing and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Nothing changing in their life. Maybe because nothing's been given to them. Maybe they select the places that's just ascetic and sound and all that stuff. Saul is that guy. Now, he's got a great pastor teacher. But he don't pay any attention when he goes. Listen, if, 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 he, if the pastor's not teaching something that he selectively wants to learn, he don't listen. If that's you, you better change your life. This story is for you. If you're on the internet and you're that kind of a guy, you need to drop in on me every Tuesday night and stay with me for one year and stop trying to select what you want to study. Let God select what you need to study. Sit down, shut up, and, and grow up. And that's the truth of the matter. That is the truth of the matter. One name assigned to this monument would be hero worship. Except it's, he's internalized it. This is what he desires more in his life than anything. That victory gave him that opportunity to pull that hero worship out. That's what he desires. He wants other people to see him that way. And he thinks that would be the greatest day of his life. And yet when it came, it was the worst day. Because none of it, it was all phony baloney. It was all phony baloney. That monument was absolutely more than he could have ever possibly imagined what that monument meant. It meant what it really meant to God was ions away from what it meant to him. They were not on the same page. I tell you, believers worship all kinds of details of life. In Romans 125, it says, for they exchanged. Now, that word is a key word. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Can you imagine that? Who in their right mind would do that? Saul? That's Saul did. How about you? They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Peter did. Jesus called his hand on it, didn't he? He called his hand. He called his bluff. He said, I don't think he got four kings. He called his hand. They exchanged, and listen, it was all about worship. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. See, that exchange deal, it's about who you worship. See, Satan tried to offer Jesus that big deal in, Roman, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, to whom he would worship. It's all about worship. This exchange of, of truth for lies and lies for truth, listen, this is all about worship. Who are you, the bottom line is who's going to worship. When you're in the old man cosmos diabolicals, you're worshiping, listen, that, you're worshiping the lies from Satan, uh, John 8, 44. And you've got to get out of that. That will stick your life. I'm telling you, that is the worst thing you can possibly do when you, get, when you hit spiritual maturity. I'm telling you. I am telling you the absolute truth. Saul, like Cain, thought he could worship the Lord by adding his own rules and conditions while ignoring the will of God. Right? It's exactly what he did. He did the same thing Cain did. Listen, I see people all the time. It breaks my heart. I understand Samuel crying all night. It breaks my heart when I see people do this. You pour your soul in it, and you go like, yeah, why? And they come, and they just blow it off. It's the most. But listen, that's part of carrying the mail. 
I, didn't, I can't let that get me because it's just carrying the mail. My job is to carry the mail. Be faithful and carry the mail. So I try to do that. Listen to Matthew. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, which is key to this passage, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate one and love the other, he'll be devoted one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. You know what that monument is? Mammon. It's an important detail to Saul, but listen, it shocked everybody else that he set up a monument to himself. Who does that? Okay. Somebody that's involved in conformity to the world, not transformation. Jesus made it this doctrinal point to the woman at the well. In John, the fourth, fourth chapter, in verses 19 through 26, in this great discussion he has with this woman, this conversation, there's a punchline in there when he says, you worship what you do not know. Can you imagine that? That didn't set well with her at all. But it was the absolute truth. And so he meets this woman, and he said, look, it's time for me to speak the truth to your heart. And he spoke a lot of truth to her, didn't he? Oh, yeah, I know, I know. Go call your husband. Oh, well, uh, we're kind of, uh, I know. Listen, I know the whole story. I'm just calling you out. There's changes have to come in your life. There needs to be some changes in your life. Oh, I know it. Well, today's the day for him. I'm going to put you on a journey of changes. See, that's what Christ does for your life. And listen, he puts you on all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of changes. You've been on a journey since the day you got saved. You've been on a journey of change. But when it comes to spiritual maturity change, now you're into big time stuff. The key word for you in spiritual maturity is the word transformation. You should live with that word every day. Because he wants you to transform weakness into strength in your life. And the only way you can do it is by the power of God. You can't do it any other way. You can't take pills. You can't take psychology. You can't take this. You can't take that. You got to take in the word of God and apply it. You got to cycle it. You got to second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 it. Jesus says to him, you worship what you don't know. And listen, he tells her, let me tell you the key to worship, salvation through Christ. That's what he told her. You know why you people don't know what you worship? Because you don't have the source. You don't have the source to get to God because to get to God, you have to go through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody can come to the Father except through me. That's why you worship. She says, we got a temple. We got the Torah. We got this. We got that. Let me tell you what you don't have in your worship is a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And all this other stuff is just foolishness. It's just nodding to God and going to hell. You can read that in John 4, 24. Therefore, you need to understand the importance. You want to worship? I'm all for that. It's worship God through Jesus Christ. You've got to believe he went and died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16. The gospel, which I just spoke, is the power of God, the power of God to begin this exchange, this whole deal of change in your life. Worship is never going to happen. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't care what you worship. It doesn't matter if it's not through Christ. You don't get to God. God is the point of worship. You don't get there apart from it. He says to the woman, he says to the woman, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And listen, she got it. She knew when she heard that. She didn't have that. Then he says, listen, I'm the guy. Oh, I know that I've heard that that, that will be when the Messiah comes. What a lucky day for you, honey, because I is him. And it wasn't, wasn't it a wonderful day for her? And wasn't it a wonderful day for the whole city? <laughs> the, number three, the worst deception could
could be self-deception. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it could be. All deception is bad. You know who the master deceiver is? Satan. In this story, Saul is a classic example of the worst deception is self-deception. Saul convinces himself that he was doing the will of the Lord by substituting his will into the program. Jesus made it clear, it's not my will, but thy will be done. That's not how he did it. Listen, his will sometimes has to be improvised. It has to be, you have to put your two cents in. Hmm? And it doesn't work that way. Because it's grace. It's all about grace. It's all about grace. Saul says to Samuel, Blessed are you, Lord. I carried out all the command of the Lord. And he says, Well, what's that bleeping? <laughs> I hear animals in this parade, this victory parade. I hear animals. You can see Saul's overwhelming need of approval for Samuel in his conversation when you read 13 through, through uh, 35 of the 15th chapter. You can see him just trying to work Samuel to get something of approval from him. You, kids do it all the time, don't they? Mummy. I do a special picture. Eh, well, that's okay. We give them approval for it. But you got to make sure that you're willing to teach them when they do something wrong, not to give them approval for it, right? Reinforcing the right things and not the wrong things is very important. The monument was tooting his own horn based on self-deception of old man cosmos diabolical lies. And it's all working from what Samuel saw in him that Saul revealed about himself to him when he said, you're little in your own eyes. That's not the way God sees you. It's not the way I see you. It's not what God, you know what God sees? God sees you as the head of the, of, of the priest nation of Israel. That's how he sees you. That's, that's the way he sees you. But listen, to get there, you've got to, you've got, you've got to get into transformation because you still see yourself. And how are you going to change that? How are you going to change that? Monuments come from come in all forms in our life. Maybe bigger barns, big man on a campus. Trophy dates, trophy wives, status symbols. And we well, listen, it's not uncommon to have, have monuments where I live. I mean, how important is that to you? How important is that to you? I mean, is it important to say that I have this address that, sh that says I'm successful? I'm not saying you shouldn't live there. I'm just saying why. See, monuments come in all kinds of forms. Saul was disillusioned by his old man Cosmos Diabolicus thinking. He's engaged in false assumptions that's led to false interpretation, that's led to false expectation, false application, as I tell you many times. Proverbs 1.5 says, A wise man will hear and increase in learning. A wise man. You know what a wise man is? It's one who's learning to live it. There's no gap in there. I'm learning, I'm living. I'm living, learning. I'm learning, living. I'm living, learning. It's a cycle. If you are a believer and overwhelmed with feelings of inadequate, then the passage for you to read and take into your life is 1 Corinthians 12, 5, and then verse 9, 10. Do what? It is 2 Corinthians. Well, I, 2 Corinthians 12. 
Second Corinthians, you know that passage, my grace is sufficient. Now let me close. Let me close today. I'm over, I'm over my time anyhow. Obeying the details of the directive will of God is not complicated. It just requires doing the will. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. When it gets complicated, you're dealing too much with weakness, not enough with, with grace. You're dealing way. Listen, grace will make the... Listen, it, it's not transfer. If it's not grace, it's reformation. If it's grace, it's transformation. I'm not talking about reformation. I'm not talking about reforming. I am not talking about that at all. I'm not talking about the power of will of man. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm not talking about that at all. James 1, 22, 23 says, Prove yourself. Prove yourself. Prove yourself to be a doer of the word, not just a mere hearer who delude themselves. In other words, the word of God is to be cycled. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face, that's the word Genesis, in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgot what kind of person he was. That's all. The details of the directive will of God were given to Saul, the details of it, and yet he says, I came back on the mission, what God wanted you to have. I, 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 I kept your command. No, I wanted the commands, plural. Saul obeyed the, the, uh, but Saul disobeyed the details of the directive by implementing his will into it, just like Cain did. God describes it as Saul turning back from following me and has not carried out my commands. God calls Saul's rebellion the sin of divination and his insubordination as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has now rejected you from being king. You see, why? Because God is just. He's, a, he's got to be a just God. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Okay. Al, close us in a word of prayer.